Happy Win Wednesday, everyone. I hope you've had a fabulous week, that your weekend was great, your week's great so far, middle of the week here, and let's drink some wine and chat, shall we? Hope your tanks are doing fabulously, and um, yeah, let's jump right in. Happy Wine Wednesday, folks. Um, I've got Holly and Cheryl with me already, and if, oh, I think, actually, I think somebody else is trying to join, and I'm missing it. Is that right? Let me see real quick, make sure we got everybody that wants to be in here. Nope, okay, I, I thought it was right. Anyhow, if anyone does try to jump in and I don't notice you trying to jump in, just uh, give me a quick comment and I'll be sure to let you in. So anyhow, um, today's topic was hydroids and I've got some pictures and some things like that to show you, but instead of like presentation style, I thought I'd ask, Holly, have you ever dealt with hydroids in your seahorse tanks? Yeah, not recently, but years ago, I kept some dwarves and they had hydroids, wiped them out. I was going to say, you just hit on one of the, the biggest topics uh, or the biggest points to this topic is that in a normal reef tank or in a uh, larger seahorse tank, they're a nuisance. You know, we don't like them. They suck. They sting me, frankly. <laughs> and, um, you know, of course, you don't want to have them, but they're not as big of a deal. But in a dwarf tank or in a fry tank, they're a huge deal. Cheryl, um, have you dealt with hydroids or can you tell us why it's so much bigger a deal in a fry tank? Uh, I have dealt with them. Uh, it's been a number of years, but it's they're one of those things that you don't even notice that they're there until they start causing problems. And that makes it, it can make it difficult. And in fact, Holly and I were just discussing it. They can come in on uh, macro, they can come in on snails, just about anything. And you know. Okay. Now, my experience here, I had a problem with them back in 2007. I ordered some dwarves from Florida. And it was a package. It came with macros and a horseshoe crab and, you know, little things to live with them that were compatible. And I'm pretty sure that they came with the hydroids. Oh, yeah. Freeze again. But anyways, I do agree, Holly. And that's one of the things that's been debated like tons of times is whether or not hydroids can come in because they're so tiny and they can, you know, you, mm -hmm. they, they're microscopic. You, you're not going to see them. And so a lot of people have, you know, wondered if they come in on brine shrimp eggs. And that's actually not true. They can't survive in, in, you know, like in the dry package or whatever. So they don't actually come in on the eggs. But Cheryl, before you freeze again, <laughs> why do you think that they are um, so commonly found coming in through an Artemia hatchery? They can come in on macro, they can come in on snails, just about anything. And oftentimes you won't even know they're there. Yep. And in fact, my first attempt at raising fry was when I first ran into hydroids because I got some macro from a friend that had a sump. And I ended up losing them. But at that point, at first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. I thought, oh, those are cute little jellyfish. <laughs> I got to right. raise them. I mean, I'm going back a lot of years. and But since that time, I'm very, very careful, particularly with my nurseries. I haven't seen any in any of my tanks in years. But with the nurseries, if you, you've got to keep them very clean. You've got to be very careful what you have for filtration in your nurseries, because that's one way, good way to get hydroids in a nursery system. The older seahorses, it typically they won't hurt them typically, but they definitely will kill fry. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, the fry are, yeah, exactly. The fry and dwarfs are just so much, they, the sting kills them, um, just like Aptasia is so, so much bigger of a deal in a fry or a um, dwarf tank. Anyhow, and, and yeah, Cheryl was just making the great point of how easily they can be brought into your tank. Um, and it, and in my personal opinion, because I've always wondered, how do they get into my hatchery? Like when I was, when I was working with fry, um, it would seem to me that when I added Artemia from my personal hatchery that I had hatched myself, all of a sudden I'd get hydroids in the fry tank. And my, my what I think is happening is cross-contamination. Because, <laughs> for instance, if there is hydroids in my main display tank, my adult tank, and I'm collecting the fry from there, 
and I'm putting them in a fry tank, it could they could be on the fry. <laughs> or even one little teeny tiny drop of water, you know, from that adult tank or from a, a contaminated source and you've got hydroids. So exactly. what I would say, and I've got some pictures to show you guys, but what I would say, first of all, is if you're working with dwarfs or fry, um, and Cheryl, I'm curious to your opinion about this, but I would say maybe go ahead and prophylactically treat the tank. How do you feel about that? It's a lot easier to start out with everything sterile and it, than it is to try to eradicate them. Once you've got them, because they're so small, they go through a planarial stage, they have multiple stages in their reproductive physiology, and we normally don't realize that they're there until they hit the Medusa stage, which is the free swimming, look like little jellyfish stage. So they're really easy to miss. Yep, and uh, yeah, that's kind of what I was saying before we got all frozen up again too, is that's another thing I should point out is that, again, we said, I just personally think that in a reef tank and in a like a larger seahorse tank with larger seahorses that you've got macros and maybe coral and such, you're probably just going to have hydroids. And there are some tips we can give you for trying to cut back on organics to keep the population low. But I just, I just don't think there's really any way to avoid them in these bigger tanks. You might not even notice them, though, because they don't matter as much. Then when we're talking well, about a fry or dwarf tank, we're talking about typically a, a, a tank with no, you know, with, with completely artificial decorations or whatnot. You know, you don't have, usually have that kind of stuff in a dwarf or a fry tank. What were you going to say, Cheryl? Well, ba basically, what you know, uh, everything in, that goes into one of my tanks it gets dipped, gets fresh water soaked, and then gets to sit in quarantine until I see if anything grows. And if anything grows, everything is going out because it's not just hydroids. It's going to be uh, flatworms. There's a lot of other things that you can get in there that you don't want in a nursery system. If you're not worried about breeding, they're not... Hydroids are not going to typically hurt adult seahorses unless they're dwarf seahorses. So it's not as big a deal. Sure. And except for if you are trying to breed like I was, but you're, you know, take, when you take the fry from the, from the adult tank, one little drop, you got hydroids. So, yep. you know, she's right. Absolutely. You don't need to treat if you're just like setting up for dwarfs or um, if you have a better system than I did. Um, but like I said, these guys, these hydroids can, can come on the seahorses, on snails, on like Cheryl went through it. It's yeah, they can, they get in. And speaking of the stages, I brought pictures. Look at me all prepared. Okay. Let me see if I can find the right one. Uh, all right. So somebody just posted a picture today in one of the Facebook groups, a snail that they had, they thought they had feather dusters on the snail. Yep. And it was covered with hydroids. Yep. The colonial phase. Okay, and guys, at the very bottom, I want to make sure I do say that the Washington State Department of Ecology, this is where I got the picture. But this is basically showing you the life cycle um, that Cheryl was just describing. Um, there are so many different kinds of hydroids, like species. It, And I got the name right there. Nidarians, right? I hope I got that right. I did look it up. I did, like, get the Google to tell me how to say it, but... We're good. Anyhow, so they can they can be these little you, you when we see them in the tank, we usually see them in the planarial phase, the larval phase, or in the medusa phase, as um, Cheryl stated. And I will you know post a link to this picture if you want it. But it's this is just showing you the life cycle and showing you that you know it could be a little teeny tiny fertilized egg that's coming in that you just don't see. So it's so hard. Um, but we're, we're going to show you how to get rid of them if you want to and tell you the tricks and, and things about that. And um, this and the hydroid colony phase, the colony phase is where a lot of people will also begin to notice them. So if you, you'll you see little planaria looking things, white little white things swimming through the tank, or let's see if I can get my other picture up, or you will see these guys. Nope, that's the wrong picture. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. Or you'll see these. They look like little snowflakes or little uh, stars when they actually land or attach on something or on the glass. Um, 
And when they're swimming through, they literally do, as Cheryl said, look like little teeny jellyfish. They look like little baby jellies. Um, but they're really, really, really small. This isn't a fantastic picture. And if you notice on the glass, it's the glass isn't very good. It's got a bunch of gunk on it. So obviously, my this is my picture, and my tank was not very clean. And this was a seahorse tank. It was just larger seahorses. Okay, and then the other way that people usually see them is this picture is by, well, I don't know why that one won't go away. Okay, this picture is Heather, I'm going to butcher the name again, Heather, I'm sorry, Heilman, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but she showed a picture. They're often confused with feather dusters because if you look at that, many people would think that that was a feather duster. I was looking before we started the stream and I was going to say that the way I typically can look and determine whether it's a feather duster or not is whether they retract, but then I learned, nope, some of the hydroids can retract. And also whether the feathers are feathered. <laughs> I know that's like so scientific, right, y'all? But I mean, if you look, I can't zoom in very much closer, but uh, Heather's picture is actually on the post if you want to go see that too and zoom in. But I just personally think that hydroids, uh, when they're in this colonial phase and attached, um, they're feathery, they're I don't know what they're called. They're little stringy things um, aren't as feathered out and they're more like uh, individual stingy things. I'm so scientific, y'all. I know. I'm just... they, they don't have a solid tube like feather dusters do. Ah. They, and you can see them because the tube rem will remain and then when they retract, you lose all the little feathery things. Yeah. With colonial hydroids, you start messing with them and they're all going to kind of try to disappear and ah. you will not see the tubes still in place. Gotcha. So they're a little different to look at, but they, they can be hard to differentiate. And and we're jumping around a bit, guys, but, um, and Cheryl, and all of us are in Seahorse Sources Group, and if you have a question about what something is, we're there to help, of course. Just trying to give you a little um, pictures to show you what we're talking about. And then uh, the final picture I did have was this, which is terrible, <laughs> terrible picture. And we'll, we'll, we're going to cover what it's about. I just wanted to show it in case I forget later. You know, Wine Wednesday goes. Um, but as we get to talking about the treatment, this was an example of when I first tried. Let me back up. As I mentioned earlier, I decided that I wanted to try to get hydrates out of my main display tank because all of my fry were coming from my main display tank and I kept having hydrates in the fry tanks. And so I decided to, and I also had aptasia problems and the medication that we're, or the treatment that we discussed in a little bit about treating hydroids also often works for aptasia. And so I pulled half of my rock out of my display tank, left half in there so the biological was still good, pulled half my rock out and tried to treat with uh, pancor, pancor or fenbedazole, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, fenbedazole, however you say it. Um, but anyways, I accidentally got the granules. So I know I'm throwing a lot at you. We'll cover it in more detail in a minute, but you definitely want the liquid because as you can see, that big white powdery stuff um, was granules and it did not work. <laughs> and I wasted a lot of time until someone finally told me, you got to use the liquid form. But I'll bring that back up if we need to. But anyways, okay, so I think we kind of covered what they look like, um, that they can come in on anything. So unless you have a completely rockless, sandless, snailless, you know, just a tank with some, some chains, you're probably going to see hydroids. So, uh, Cheryl, I'm trying to let everybody get up in here. Um, what is your method for treating a tank for, with, for hydroids? Radic I, well, everything I do that goes into one of my tanks anymore oh, right. is going to be treated and is going to be quarantined. And what I'm looking for, whether it be macro, snails, or anything else that's coming in, is what to grow on them. Because I need to know before I add them to my tank. And I don't have any problems anymore, but when I first started, I had a ton of problems with hydroids. But those came in, I'm pretty sure, on some macro back then. I thought, well, add some macro to the nursery. It'll help the filtration. Yeah. Bad idea. And so, I mean, yeah, that's actually a really good answer. So if you have the patience, the time, and the ability to truly quarantine something and, like, feed the quarantine uh, tank to make sure that no aptasia come out or no hydroids come out, because, they're, you know, all of these critters only respond to food. 
you know, they, they won't come out until they have something, uh, something enticing them to come out. Um, mm -hmm. So Cheryl's method is to quarantine long enough and, and, and properly so that she really can try to avoid adding them because she gives them time to come out. Most of us aren't that, aren't that patient. <laughs> so it, it, it takes some patience to do that, <clears throat> but it's a lot easier to have them in a sterile tank and you can nuke the tank if you have to, uh, versus a tank where you've got bra or whatever else in there. Yeah. And now you've got a serious problem because you can't really nuke the tank, but you're stuck with hydroids, septasia, whatever. Yep. Holly, what did you do before I go through what I did? Well, <laughs> yours was Honestly, a long time ago. Right. Anything. I didn't keep dwarves anymore is what happened. Basically, <laughs> the hydroids wiped them out. Oh. And then I was I was just like, no, <laughs> not again. Oh. But I've kept bigger seahorses since. And I have fry. I've been raising fry. And to me, that, that gives me kind of the same satisfaction as the dwarves sure. did because they're little and cute, but they're honestly a lot easier and they grow up. And yeah, they grow up. They don't have as hard of a time. I'm, I'm really impressed though, before I move on, that you have been able to not um, somehow transfer because your, ta your, your fry are born in your main tank, right? They are, but so, I don't have any hydroids in my main tank. I'm, I'm sure because I, the one thing I remember about how I used to be able to tell there was hydroids is in that stage you were talking about when they look like a tiny snowflake yep. pressed on the glass of the aquarium. And that's how I recognize hydroids because they really are tiny. It's hard for me to see them any other way. So that's kind of how I know, but I don't bring in stuff to that tank anymore, really. It's got the same stuff that it's had for years, and maybe I just got lucky, you know? And you're smart because, you know, most people want to add, 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 and when you do that, you just risk, risk, risk. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I've added stuff, but it's been a long time, and I didn't quarantine, geez. you know, honestly. I do just add stuff, but I haven't added anything in a long time. So I think I've just been lucky. I put the macros in that I told you about, but they came from Algae Barn, which you recommended as a pretty clean source. So I think they were fine. And I just haven't had a problem, knock on wood. So. Exactly. I, Algae Barn does have clean macros where they literally grow them in house. Um, and we'll be talking more with algae burn soon. I got some exciting things to announce, but not today. Anyways, um, they grow them in house. They only give you, you know, what they've grown. Like they obviously have to get them from somewhere, but then they quarantine them the way Cheryl does like really extensively. They grow them themselves and then they sell only clippings that they know are clean and, and have been treated and everything else. So algae burns a really good, um, option. All right, and let me see. Uh, I'm oh gosh, I'm missing all these comments. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lucy, for taking care of the comments. <laughs> and Holly, I see you there. We will talk green. I did. Um, Grit Grizz Aquatic said quarantine should last at least six weeks. Um, good. Most people are not committed that that much. I couldn't agree with you more. But especially with like macros and stuff, it looks clean. You think you're good, or snails, or even in a coral tank. You know how many times have we seen? coral uh, or, or macros be added to a display a display reef tank or green hit green bubble algae or green hair and all that stuff that because of the, it came in on the plug you know and frankly I have to really quickly tell you that in my reef tank I absolutely know I have hydroids <laughs> because my one of my very good friends Lorenzo uh, gifted me this gigantic gorgonian i mean it is the centerpiece of my reef tank and it's so beautiful and so huge i mean i've i've literally um given pieces all away to friends and it's just still massive anyhow it's this huge gorgonian that i could never remove and i would love to see a piece in my seahorse tank but its whole base is covered in hydroids <laughs> so 
I was like, thanks a lot, Lorenzo. But anyways, <laughs> anyways, what okay. Thing, Kelly, I don't have <laughs> coral at all. Right. I don't keep any coral, so that might be part of it too. We're, and that's and I was making the point about the reef yeah. tank, but it, I keep uh, gorgonians for sure in my seahorse tanks. I would never in a dwarf or a fry tank for these reasons, but you know that they get added on those too for sure. Um, okay, just reading the comments before we get to the uh, the treatment. Real, real quick, go ahead, Kelly. Uh, w one of my favorite problems was I had gotten some, uh, a, a bunch of copepods, tiny copepods. That's what I was working with engines. Uh -huh. And next thing I know, I'm seeing Fry in my nursery sitting there and acting like they're stuck against the side of the, the nursery tub and wiggling, trying to get loose. Uh. And I literally took an eyedropper, sucked it up, put it under a microscope. And what I had in there were some very tiny flatworms. Oh, geez. The breeder that sent me the copepods, I received an email from her a couple of days later going, I just discovered those pods that I sent you were invested with flatworms. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> that it sucks. Was, and I mean, yeah, that's it, that's why your comments and uh, Grizz Aquatic, am I saying it right, Grizz? Is that correct, Aquatics? Um, you, you know, quarantine is for sure the best way to, to do your best to avoid these things but sometimes stuff just happens you know like who would be you would have never known until you saw a problem right i mean it's just so yeah anyways i do see questions about dwarfs and i think lucy's kind of um handling those because yeah she's the dwarf queen in my book because i i, I have never kept dwarfs so what she's saying i agree with <laughs> and let's see Okay, um, I'm gonna, okay, I don't wanna sit here and read while we're talking. All right, so anyways, if you're in quarantine, we've talked about it's the best way. However, if you're in a situation where you've got fry or you've got dwarf seahorses and you've added a snail or a gorgonian or whatever, and all of a sudden you're seeing either co the colonial hydroids um, from rock or whatever, or the little Medusa looking, snowflake looking, jellyfish looking little hydroids um, on the glass or swimming throughout the tank. The way that I like to treat is using panker, fenbendazole. Does anyone want to correct my pronunciation on that? Am I saying it right, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think Dan has corrected me on it before. So, And as I mentioned earlier, you definitely want to get the liquid form. Um, this one's not called Pancur, it's Safeguard. It's the only one I could find when I was dealing with Fry. But I'll try to show you guys up close, maybe. If you see up close, it does say Fembendazole. And it's actually a dewormer. So the first few, few things I want to say about this is get the liquid, not the granules. Understand that it's a dewormer. So if you have like bristle worms, if you have anything like that in your tank, this is going to wipe them out. Two worms, any of any worms <laughs> are going to go bye-bye. So a lot of people have used this improperly and tried to dose like a display tank with it, not realizing how many like bristle worms or whatever they had. And then they get this huge ammonia spike because the worms are dead within the rock and big mess. So, you know, if you've got a big old rocky looking tank with lots of worms, um, might be better to treat outside the tank, um, if that makes sense. I know... Well, Obviously that, again, the main reason hydroids are an issue is in a dwarf or a fry tank. So in those tanks, you usually don't have the big bulky rocks and the, you know, everything everywhere. Might have macros, so it can happen, or contamination from the main tank. But anyways, okay, so how to use this? Let's go through it, shall we? All right, so the dosing instructions for this is 0.1 to 0.2 milliliters per 10 gallons. Um, you do that. You repeat that every other day for a total of three treatments, so six days. Um, this will seriously knock out the hydroids. It will seriously, in most cases, knock out aptasia. If it doesn't knock them out within three days, you can go for a full six days. I'm sorry, in six days, three treatments. Then you can go for six treatments. It's really, really, really not harmful to the fry, the dwarfs, or the seahorses. They don't care about it a bit. 
However, it will cloud the water, so it kind of looks funky. Um, but if, you know, and of course we're saying don't do it in a big reef or um, seahorse tank display that has worms or anything like that in it. But in a dwarf or seahorse or fry tank, uh, this works really well. It also actually, if you do have a dwarf tank that is based on biological filtration, this will not knock it out as long as it's used properly. Um, so it doesn't hurt biological. It will hurt many macros. So Calerpa and any of the simple macros like that, don't care, this won't kill it. But some of the more um, complex Pretty macros will be are very sensitive to this. Inverts are also very sensitive to this. So again, in a dwarf or a fry tank, you typically don't have inverts. You typically don't have these things in, in those tanks, but just making sure I say it so <laughs> I don't tell anybody wrong. And um, okay, what else do I need to say about that? Oh, when during well, while you're treating um, and constantly, a big deal is to wipe down the sides because as we've shown, they like to stick to the glass and stuff. And so you can sometimes get rid of the problem before it begins if you're wiping down your glass constantly um, and you don't want to leave any there. Uh, let's see. What else, guys? Have you ever used this, uh, Cheryl, or no? Yes. Okay. And what else I, am I... I have some here, right? Now. I always keep some on hand. Uh, I don't know when, when the last time I used it was. One of the things too that you need to watch out with the panic here is some corals and invertebrates, not just worms, are very right. sensitive to it. And you can, I would not recommend treating a reef display tank with panic here right. for that reason. I'll add Gorgonians to that list too. Uh, I lost a Gorgonian because I thought um, it would be all right. And I, I'm not speaking for all Gorgonians, but the one I had did not like that treatment and I ended up losing it so definitely yeah she's right if you're talking about a reef it's probably not that big of a deal now I hate them just in general because I'm so sensitive that I stick my hand in my reef tank and I come out and I've got little I don't even know how to describe it it looks like little stings uh, on my hand like little bubbly stings you can't see them very well the boyfriend always says I'm nuts and they're not really there, but they are. <laughs> and, am I crazy, you guys? Or have you stuck your hand in a tank with hydroids and it, and you get stung? It, it feels itchy when you get out, right? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to pretend you all said right. All right. Anyways. Um, but I would not, I agree with Cheryl. I would not personally treat the, um, reef tank in a reef tank. I would personally, if I found colonial hydroids, I'd remove the rock and try to get like the base and everything off outside of the tank um, and then if I had the free swimming type uh, life stage free swimming type what I would do is cut back I mean they they like to eat baby brine shrimp they like to eat that kind of thing so you know remove the food or out compete them you know in a reef but what, what we're based so I just keep saying it, but I want to make sure I'm clear. What we're really talking about is treating a dwarf or fry tank because that's when it becomes a serious issue. Or you could be crazy like me and remove half your rock, um, use the granules first, and totally waste time. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I mean that it did end up working. When I, when I got the liquid, I was able to treat half the rock, put it back. It kept all of its biological filtration. Remove the other half. I don't think the tank was fully eradicated because, as I've said repeatedly, it can be uh, you can transfer hydroids with one little drop of water. So um, another thing I want to say just before I forget is make sure that if you're dealing with separate tanks like fry tank, uh, adult tank, and then hatchery where you're hatching the baby brine shrimp, make sure they're in separate areas and make sure you have separate equipment. You know, don't take the net or the scraper or the whatever from this tank and use it on that one. Or worse yet, if you have a reef, don't use that on the seahorse or fry tank. You know, that those kind of things you probably already know, but I'm just trying to mention everything. Um, and let's well, see. Go ahead. I, I do the same thing. Every single tank has its own siphon, its own net, its own light system. I mean, every piece of equipment that goes touches one tank never touches another tank and that absolutely that can be a big deal absolutely another thing to mention um since we are talking about something you know that you're putting in your tank 
is again just another reason not to use it on a reef display or a large seahorse tank with a bunch of rock and macros is because we already mentioned that inverts, coral, things like that are sensitive to um, panker. Um, but, oh, and, not but, and it actually can be soaked into like your substrate or your rock. Um, so let's say you somehow remove all your inverts, which would, I can't even imagine trying to do that in any of my bigger tanks that have those kind of things. Um, but let's say you manage to remove them all, manage to remove all the coral, all the gorgonians, all the macros, all that, and then wanted to just treat the whole tank. Well, then you put your stuff back even four weeks later, and it's still leaching back out of the rock. So it's it, it's still going to bother those things. So again, I, did, I know I keep repeating myself, but um, it won't kill biological filtration, but it will stay with you <laughs> for a while. So well, the, the granules are the worst for that because what it does is it actually gets into rocks yeah. and it can take months, sometimes even longer to actually completely dissolve. Right. And that can really ca cause problems. That definitely use liquid. Absolutely. And when I, uh, the picture I showed you where I was actually treating uh, my rock for Aptasia and for hydroids, where I took half the rock out, um, in that tank, that's actually how I lost the gorgonian is because I put the gorgonian back too quickly. I can't give you an exact date. Please don't ask like, you know, six weeks, eight weeks. What I don't have a date, but I know that I can currently keep gorgonians in that tank. <laughs> so I would just say, try not to treat the rock unless, you know, you, you really need to. And if you do wait as long as possible, maybe do some testing as far as putting, you know, like a, something small in there to see how it reacts. Don't throw your inverts all back in there at once and lose them all. Um, all right, just trying to see if there's anything else I want to say about it and then uh, jumping over to comments. I, I'll type up the treatment too, but it's really just basic. 0.1 to 0.2 per 10 gallons every other day, three to you six. You don't just stuff the bottle in like I do? No, no. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, seriously, it's not, it's not that worrisome because it's, I mean, the seahorses, fry, dwarf, any kind, it just... I mean, isn't it kind of shocking to see them swimming around in this murky water and they don't care? They're like, where's the food? Well, I always kid about it. If you get stuff like, uh, whether it's Aptasia or Hydroids or whatever, the simplest thing is take everything out and use a flamethrower. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Oh, uh, one thing I did forget to mention is the place to find Panker is at like a tractor supply store. I found it at a, um, oh, no, I'm gonna, it, actually it was, I think it was Tractor Supply Store was the name of it, so, um, oh, but any kind of hardware store like that. Go, what'd you say, Holly? I said it's a goat dewormer, so Correct. any farm supply place should yep. have it. Yep, and I'm going to jump to questions and make sure um, that I've covered everything. I took notes, that's why I keep glancing down, because I wanted to make sure. I didn't want to give a big presentation, but I wanted to make sure to. And we did cover ways to prevent start with dry rock and artificial decorations. Wash your hands. We mentioned getting different um, equipment for each tank, but also it can a little teeny drop on your hands. So if you're going from tank to tank, wash your hands in between really well. Um, and yeah, like I, I still I still don't have an answer, but I would love for any. I'm, asking you guys actually because I do believe and know that they've proven that um, hydroids can't survive the um, packaging and sale of Artemia eggs, brine shrimp eggs. So how do they end up in the hatchery? If somebody's really careful and I mean obviously that's what they want to eat the baby brine shrimp so yeah they're all about it but how do they get in? Do you guys have any idea? It was a cross, it had to be a cross contamination. I mean, yeah. and it might, and it might, you know, maybe it's not even in the hatchery, to be honest, because what people notice is that when they add the, the hatched Artemia, baby Artemia to their tank, then all of a sudden they have a hydroid explosion, but it That's might just be the hydroids are moving and looking for food. Might just yeah. be that they were in the fry tank and all of a sudden they had food, but um, yeah. Okay. Anyways, um, I know we, uh, someone wanted to, 
discussed green green bubble algae also. So <clears throat> let me see. I'm going to go go to the uh, comments just to make sure. Um, I know we kind of jumped around, guys, but did that basically tell you how to treat, how to maybe try to avoid? Oh, one other thing I did forget to say is when you're treating with Panker, um, make sure that I don't, you know, usually a dwarf or fry setup doesn't have all the extensive equipment, but if you do have like a UV sterilizer or... Um, a skimmer, any of that, any carbon anywhere, make sure it's all removed or turned off because you want this to work and not get soaked up by carbon or taken out by a skimmer and whatnot. So keep those things off while you're treating and turn them back on as soon as you're done. In fact, add a bunch of carbon when you're done and hope that uh, it's not soaked into, <laughs> into anything in your tank. All right. But it's just really super not dangerous to your filtration, to your seahorses, to your fry, etc., but it is a big deal to inverts coral. I think we've covered it. What do you guys say? All right, let me see. What, and Grizz Aquatics keep, you know, keeps mentioning if you're doing a proper quarantine, that shouldn't happen. But with hydroids, though, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of having them in, in many seahorse tanks because, and, and in my fry tanks, because it's just, they're so microscopic. I mean, even after quarantine, if you don't treat during quarantine, it's like, and you can't treat macros and stuff with this because macros are sensitive to it. Most macros, I should say. But anyways, all right. Yes, cross-contamination. Right, Lucy's backing me up on will harm inverts very badly. And Grizz, I'm, I, uh, Aquatics, I'm really curious how you um quarantine your inverts in a separate tank like what your process is i know how you do it but i'm saying like what's your process like with snails and um i've always thought like with with in a reef tank with coral when you got the plugs obviously people now remove the plugs and and dip the coral but um inverts and macros and things that's not so easy to do they're too sensitive in most cases so i'm curious how you do that and what you use um and sea bass uh, cameo, is that it? Oh, I just lost it. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. okay. Kelly, I'm thinking too, if you do have a reef take and you remove everything, your invertebrates and all that, and then you treat the seahorses with the panicure, you know, and, and the tank without the inverts and stuff, but you put those things back in. And right. they might still be carrying the hydroids. True. So Absolutely. You know. When I treated my I, rock, I, I got I think I just got lucky. And to be really hundred percent honest with you, this was a big seahorse tank. And as I said, I, I was trying to minimize the amount of times that hydroids got transferred just during a fry transfer to a fry mm -hmm. tank, but my main focus was the aptasia. Um so to be fair. That, that's what I was really after, and it did work for the Aptasia, and I've not seen hydroids in the tank since, but mm -hmm. I also really got up to my filtration, got organics lower, so that might be part of it too. And I never had the colonial kind where you could see like batches of them, or I never saw that life phase, I should say, excuse me. Well, I'm thinking too, if you know that you have them in your reef tank where your fry are born, can you do then just kind of like the formalin, like once the fry are born and you transfer them to your fry system, then treat them with the panicure, and then you know you've zapped them. Is that a reasonable way to do it, you think? That's, I'm so glad you asked that. Number one, that's what I did. Um, that's what I kind of meant by prophylactically treating. It's different. I know we're talking about different situations, whether you're talking about fry or dwarf tank, because... It's different but in my fry tank that's what I did treat with panker almost every time I didn't usually wait until I saw hydroids mainly because it yeah. just didn't hurt the fry at all exactly that just seems smart to me if you know you have the problem and there's not a way to really take care of it right. in yeah. your main tank then you can take care of it in the fry system Gerald some, were you some gonna... invertebrates will, will not be harmed by panicure oh. uh, the serious snails will typically go right through it like it never even happened. Nice. So you have to kind of watch what you're treating. And I'll be honest with you, 
virtually everything that comes in the house other than seahorses gets soaked in fresh water first thing. That's good and, too. I mean, it's automatic. And if I, yeah, I'm gonna lose some mackerel along the way. I lose a few inverts, but I'd rather lose some of the than have to deal with the problem down the road. Sure. And another point I wanted to make about Holly's comment, and Lucy, I'd love to get your opinion on this. Uh, many people actually use um, formalin for hydroids. Now, I personally, like, uh, let me rephrase that. Many people who say they've tried to use Panker and it didn't work or, you know, whatever, then will try formalin and have had some success. So I'm curious. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Um, so... Hey, Jerry, I'm curious if you ever dealt with hydroids in your dwarf tank. That's what we're chatting about tonight, but we're getting ready to go to open chat. I just want to make sure that we've fully covered it. Um, but anyways, did want to finish up with formalin because I know I'm jumping around, guys. So if you do try the three treatments of Panker and you're still seeing that there's a problem, you can go up to six treatments, um, which would be 12 days. It's every other day. And then if still whatever for some reason it's some species that's you know you're not get killing with the panker then the other idea is to use um formalin and let me get my my little handy notes here 37 percent of course one milliliter per 10 gallons every other day for three days to six days now again invertebrae and all that or invertebrates and all that are sensitive to formalin too so we're, we're really focusing on dwarf and fry tanks, guys, but um, I know hydroids are a pain in every tank. I just, they're not as big of a deal, you know. So let me know if I've covered everything. I'm jumping into the comments because I know Seabass Camino was asking a couple of things. And you just sent a request to join what? Seahorse Sources Group or this call? Um, just want to make sure I'm not leaving anybody out here. Okay, Seahorse Sources Group, gotcha. Yep, we're all there. And Lucy mentioned for dwarfs, it's pretty easy to do tank transfer and bleach everything to get rid of most and finish it with Vimbendazel. Right. Absolutely. Um, but Lucy, so do you use, I, I call it Fenben, guys, because I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly anyways. <laughs> so um, do you use that automatically on a dwarf or fry tank or no? Only if you see the problem. Curious. And... Oh, okay, who is, um, I'm seeing the name change. I won't announce it out loud. Lucy's a freshwater girl. And, okay, if I miss your question, guys, then please make sure to holler and make sure that I do go and uh, answer it again because I'm trying to make sure that I catch everybody's. And Lucy, I'll share a picture of my gourd, uh, Gorg. I'll post it after after we're done here. But I think we um, covered this pretty well. And Miss Holly is coming in at the exact right time because I knew I didn't forget. I, it was like green bubble algae now. <laughs> okay, so if you have more questions about hydroids, um, whether you should treat, uh, what they're about, anything that we've talked about, please feel free to comment. I do check the comments. I will get back with you. And, of course, join Seahorse Sources Group to um, ask in there also because we're all there. And Holly has asked um, very asked us to discuss green bubble algae. And the issue is that it's on the bottom in the, of the rocks, and she wants to know how to destroy them without destroying her display. So the sea bass has already commented emerald crab. And how do you guys feel about emerald crabs in seahorse tanks, guys? I've had them and had no problem. Cheryl, you probably wouldn't, would you? Is Cheryl frozen again? <laughs> okay. Uh oh. Okay. Well, I I I had never kept emerald crabs in my seahorse tanks. Just um, you know, I was don't do anything risky. Holly has and never has had a problem. I think Lucy does too. Um. And I make Lucy, did you maybe like add an emerald crab until the green bubble algae was gone and remove it? Or did you just never have trouble with them? Or what up? Uh, let me know. And 
I was kind of looking around before I got in here because I've honestly, Holly, to be really honest with you, I've never had bubble algae in my seahorse tank. I couldn't tell you why. I have it in my reef, but it's just, um, you know, a different situation. In the reef, what I would do really is make sure to have a, an air, a suctioning airline going um, and make sure I was holding the suctioning right over so that any of the spores, if, if I accidentally popped one, any of the spores would go up the airline um, and I would just either use my hand or some, you know, anything to get as, as underneath because usually it's like a carpet. That green bubble algae is like a, it, it, at least the when I had it. It was more like a carpet. So once you could get your nail or something right up under the base of it, the carpet of it, then you could almost pull it all the way up. And I would just keep my airline over that area to remove any spores as best I could. And then also, um, you know, if I couldn't get it up in a big patch, then I, I honestly would sometimes just use the airline to try to remove it. And, and I just felt like if you're suctioning as you're removing it, then you're pulling it up. But underneath the rocks, ooh, I don't know. What are, um, try to join that. Will magnesium work on that? Magnesium, I, I, I'm not sure. The other thing um, I've heard is peroxide. I wish, Dan uh, will be back, I, I hope next week, you guys. Um, but uh, he's hard at work. I wish he was here, though, because he's the peroxide man, and he could tell us. I know you don't want to overdo it with peroxide, so I want to make that very clear. Too much peroxide can mess mess, mess you up. Um, but a little bit, um, I do believe, will destroy green bubble out. No, green, I keep saying green, bubble algae. Uh, you just got to be careful about the amount. Go ahead. You can look it up the dose. I've done that before with other types of algae. Yeah. And it works. You know, you just use a little bit and there is stuff online. You can kind of Google it and find out what's safe to use. And the way I used to, because I used to use it to clean my um, glass on the front of the tank, the algae, before I found Magic Eraser. Oh, yeah. So I used to put a little bit onto a sponge or a cotton pad and rub it on the algae. But you can put a tiny bit in a syringe and just squirt it on there. I used to do that for any, um, um, like, I don't even know what it would be called, like the brown hair algae, the matting brown hair algae. Oh, I hated that stuff. I don't know the name of it, <laughs> but it was some sort of filmy, oh, it looked like a dang carpet. I hated the stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I would just love, squirting peroxide on it, seeing it turn ghost white and fall off. I'd be like, yes, I got you. <laughs> all right. I'm a little nuts, but that's okay. Anyways, okay, Holly asked, how many crabs would you put in? The tank is 90 gallons. All right, so feel free to answer you guys' opinion. In my reef, which was 50, which is 55 gallons, I had like two at all times. Um, Yep, two. Yep. And a four gallon. So, yeah, I'd say maybe three. Yeah. In her size. And the other catch is just to let you know, um, Holly, is that it's not guaranteed. So, uh, just, just kind of throwing it out there is that I've never had an emerald crab not eat bubble algae. They do. That's what I got them for in the reef. Um, and they, they worked. But, um, you know, some people have said they've gotten them and then they don't. So, um, I would try that first of all, because yeah. And I know Seabass asked, do you have a picture? Because I'm curious what you mean by up under the rocks. Like, is it, if it's visible to you and bothering you, obviously you can see it, but you, I'm assuming you can't get to it. Is that the deal? Um, and I can, uh, also, you know, ask around too, and maybe see if Dan can be here next time to talk about peroxide and try to get you some more answers because yeah. With me, it's always been emerald crabs, peroxide, or removing the rock and uh, taking it off. And I know you don't want to do that. Um, so anybody in the comments, any other thoughts? Lucy? Oh. I think bubble algae. That when my tank was new, you know, I went through all these different algaes, but they seemed to take care of themselves after the tank was going for a while. Yep. 
I mean, I haven't had that in a long time, but I do remember it. Right. From the beginning. It's so I'm nice when your tank is finally like established and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, really established, not just cycled, but established. <laughs> it's amazing. But go ahead, Cheryl. I've only had bubble algae once. And as soon as it started, I literally was take. somebody gave me some corals and some rock. Mm -hmm. And I put them into a tank, everything, all the stuff into one tank. And sure enough, I started getting bubble algae. And I literally just removed the individual rock, rocks and scrubbed them down. And the bubble algae was gone. I wasn't going to pop it in the tank. <laughs> right. Yeah, the big thing about not popping into the tank is because when it does, it releases all these little spores. And then you've got mm -hmm. little bubble algae everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, I, I, yeah, when I did use the airline, that just seemed to, like, I didn't notice it popping up everywhere else. Um, but, yeah, it's a pain in the butt. I, I wonder, too, um, I don't know the answer to this, so anybody in the comments, feel free. But uh, is this an algae that's super, um, I can't think of the right word, is um, based on organics and, like, nitrates and such, or nah? Anybody know? I assume all algae is to some extent, but I just wondered, you know, like some, you only see them when you got a dirty tank, putting, putting it very easily. Whereas, you know, some, did that make sense? You both look like you're looking, like you're trying to figure it out. So, all right. Anyways, how? I was thinking over because I'm pretty sure, you know, <laughs> I've had probably higher organics in my tank since I had the algae problem years ago, but not had the algae problems that I did when the tank was new. So I, I don't know that it's really that. Gotcha. I don't, you know, well, I don't the, the, the other side, this other side to that coin is, is that you've got a lot of good bacteria built up and I forget, do you, do you have macros in your tank or do you? I, I do now. Okay. Yeah, I do. I have the red, what, Ooglu or Ogle? Right, or that's right. I remember. <laughs> like that. Yeah. And they do help with the algae. The only algae really that I get now seems to be the green hair algae. Yeah. And I've had way less of it since I put those macros in. But I've noticed the green hair algae, it now grows on those macros. Oh, man. And easy to remove. Yeah. So what I do is I pull the macros out when I'm doing my weekly cleaning and I clean them, you know, in fresh salt water. I remove all the, the green hair algae from them and any bristle worms that it's caught <laughs> and, right. then put, and then put it back in the tank. I put it, but I stuff it behind my rocks because it's not pretty in my tank. Gotcha. Well, and I forgot too, Holly. The other let it do its job, but it's in the background doing its job. Hey, it doesn't. Just stop. let Cyano take over. You won't have any green hair. <laughs> oh, geez, don't say that. She said, "Let Cyano take <laughs> over." But no, but what she's oh, saying God. is kind of what I was. I had. I remember when the tank was new. I remember the cyano. Oh my gosh. I'm going to get back to you, Holly, I promise. But um, I would just say that my entire point, whether you're talking about having really established uh, good bacteria, um, a good biofilter, or whether you're, I remember, Holly, you all, aren't you one of the ones that upgraded Skimmer too? Did, did you upgrade yeah. your Skimmer? recently I'm well not recently but a while back because what i used to have well i had a 64 gallon mm -hmm. which i figured out since between the substrate and the rocks it actually holds about 55 gallons of water gotcha which i think most of us don't think about you know when right. we have a tank a 64 gallon tank but really it's not that much once you put all the stuff in it so i uh, what i started with i had a hang on back skimmer that was probably about a foot long mm. and the hang on back it just doesn't do the job no i agree and so i ended up investing in a protein skimmer that's designed for a 240 gallon tank and Bam. it turns out <laughs> it's not too big for the 64 nope. gallon it works great. It does its job, but yeah, I'm collecting stuff in it. So 
I think with protein skimmers, I think going oversized on it really helps a lot. Right. I absolutely agree with you. You can't go too big on skimmer in my, in my uh, personal opinion on a seahorse tank. And Hollywood, I was kind of, I'm coming back to you, I promise. But uh, the reason that I just um, don't have a perfect answer for you is my answer to most algae uh, or nuisance algae or those kind of problems is to outcompete it. That's just always what I've done, whether it be I beef up my biological or if it's as beefed up as it can get, like, you know, adding a sump if you have a hang on the back. Do that and add a whole bunch. Like, Holly's acting like, oh, I haven't seen algae in years. But this this woman has so much media in her sump that she, she, she's not mentioning to you. And then a big, huge, oversized skimmer. And so, you know, when you... And now the macros. I think the macros helped a lot. Yeah. And another thing is, um, in one of my tanks, I've never had to do much of anything to change anything because I use an algae scrubber in the sump. And so I'm growing the nasty, ugly, bleh. I mean, I got to clean it, harvest it, you know, but um, I grow the nasty stuff down there and I have a UV sterilizer between the sump and the tank. So therefore, you know, any little spores or whatnot get knocked off by that. And I'm just... I just, you know, have never had to do much more. But yeah, so my answer is typically to, and, and you said your tank is two years old, your fil biofiltration should be great. The only thing that I could even say about that, I, I don't know specifically what's up in your tank, but if you have a sump, maybe add even more um, bricks, bioballs, whatever. But media just to hold stuff in the sump, if you do have one. And um, I'm sorry, guys, I do love all of you, but like when I get up here live, I can't remember whose tank is what. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sure I've seen it. I'm sure I love it. But so I'll compete with other algae, with better biofilter, with better mechanical filter, um, and then emerald crabs. And then, yeah, show us a picture to show us how hard it would be to get to. Because, yeah, you can't stick an airline and suck up spores and remove underneath rocks. So I got to kind of see what you're talking about. Feel free to post and tag me on it and I'll try to help more and I'll do some research too over the next week, um, see what other people are doing and uh, ask Dan if he can't come next week, I'll at least ask him his advice about peroxide with it. Cool? Sorry, I can't give you One better thing than that. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, algae tends to be a bigger problem in, in newer tanks and they tend to stabilize themselves over time. Sure. I know a lot of people start to panic, they get green hair algae. Well, if you kick back, manually remove it as much as you can and give the tank a little bit of time, it should disappear on its own. Mm -hmm. Sure, but her tank's two years old. And, and I'm curious, Holly, um, is it just bubble algae that you're experiencing? Or do you have uh, troubles with, oh, Holly's sending me photos. Look at that, and I won't share them. Don't worry. It's blurring. I'll look as soon as we're done here, I promise, and I'll help you, and I'll, I'll get with you. Um, but I'm curious if it's just bubble algae or if you have trouble with other algae too. And and yeah, if you want to let me know on the side, that's cool too, but just do you, do you currently have a sump and just, you know, give me like the specs just so I can uh, get you exact. And uh, Grizz Aquatics said green hair algae is a sign of high phosphates or silicates. Sure. And sea bass asked the parameters, sure, yep. All those things matter. That's why it's hard to give like an overall answer because, you know, you guys' questions are perfect and, and right. You gotta kinda dig into the details. Oh, you have lots of green hair algae also. Okay, so as Grizz Aquatics just mentioned, um, it might be a phosphate thing. Do you currently test um, for phosphates and nitrates? Just curious. And actually, I don't, I, he, that's a perfect point, a great point, but I don't, I think green, with bubble algae, that stuff just shows up, man. I don't care how old the tank is. It just seems to show up. I think that's one of the, like hydroids, where, yeah, if you've got high organics, you're going to see an explosion, or high nitrates, phosphates, you're going to see uh, more. But it's got, I think they come in on something. Does that make sense? Everything comes in on something. I get that. But, like, in our tanks, we can have certain bacteria, certain um, ciliates that don't cause a problem until the organics are high and then they're a problem. 
Whereas with things like bubble algae I just, and hydroids, I feel like they have to be introduced. Um, and so they're like a problem no matter. Did that make sense? They could, there could be more or less of them based on organics feeding nitrates, phosphates, but I just feel like they're, they're like Holly's just lucky enough to never have gotten any, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's nuts. I'm jealous, but, um, and Cheryl obviously perfected her quarantine so that she doesn't have a problem anymore. Um, but Dylan, I think yeah, you, the, go ahead, Cheryl. It, the, the only time I ever have added that bubble algae was when I was given the, the rocks and some cor corals by someone else. And fortunately I put them into a quarantine tank because then I got the bubble algae and I've never had it since. Wow. Holly, uh, I saw your comment too, Dylan. Holly asked, are they bad to just leave them? Do you mean the bubble algae? Um, no. I mean, really, any al all algae is doing is taking up nitrate and phosphate in your tank. That's what it's doing. Um, we just don't like it. You know what I mean? Like, actually, if you think about it, seahorses come from some murky, algae-filled areas when from the in the wild. Um, so it's not hurting them. It just bugs us. We want a pretty tank. So no, I don't see anything wrong with leaving it except for if it expands. And the biggest problem that you're facing with bubble algae is that it'll expand and, you know, take up nutrients that other things need. If you have any coral macros, anything like that, and or cover things and, you know, not look pretty or cover and kill any coral macros, blah, 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 if that made sense. So if it's somewhere that just only you know about it and it's not spreading get an emerald crab call it a day or three in your big 92 um but yeah it's it the algae thing is mainly about us and dylan that's what i was going to say to you you are bragging about your three-month-old tank that you've never seen any algae in bite your tongue and knock on some wood buddy <laughs> right give it three more months <laughs> i mean congratulations i hope you never see any I hope you have decked out your sump because the chances has anybody ever have a tank? Actually, there are people who have, but if you don't go jumbo mumbo over the top with filtration and that such, like have either of you ever had a tank that just never had any nuisance algae? I'm going to say, I'm going to say that's no, I can tell you, I never have like, fry tanks where I was constantly cleaning them. I never saw algae, but I was constantly cleaning them. Was somebody talking? I was just saying, I mean, the fry tanks, I, I don't have ever see any algae. Um, it, it varies by tank. I had one tank that uh, was set up, had problems with green hair algae, and I manually removed it and did water changes. And within a month, it was gone. Uh, but it just, it depends on the tank. Sure. And this isn't, and this isn't in Holly's case, cause her, 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 um, tank is two years old already, but anyone who watches this, that's just started a tank like Dylan, for instance, don't freak out if you do see algae, because it's literally like a part of the natural cycle. Like mm -hmm. you read anything about setting up a reef tank. I know we're talking seahorses here, but they're going to talk about, you've got the, the the nitrogen cycle then you have the algae cycle with which adds three stages you're gonna go through the brown green and red i mean it, it's just in order to ever become like okay i know how to put it so cheryl was just saying and i was just saying that in a fry tank we don't see it because we're constantly cleaning it i don't know in my fry tanks i never had like an ongoing um filtration that didn't get reset up with every batch so the tank was never technically established when i say established i mean a tank that can literally kind of run itself because the biological and the mechanical are so in tune with the tank's needs that it's just and the feeding that you're doing that everything just kind of works um and to get to that spot you got to go through the algae phases in my opinion you guys can disagree with me in the comments if you want. But um, all of my tanks that were tanks that I set up and wanted to stay set up for years went through those algae phases. So, but Dylan, hey, show us, show us up, show us how you, how you, how it's done, 
and I don't wish it on you. I'm just saying don't freak out if it happens because it's totally natural. And the more you fight it when you're going through that initial ashy phase, you're just, you're just prolonging it. So, like, I, I'll find an article and link it when I'm done. It's, it's such a great article, and it just says, leave it alone. Let it cycle through, just like the nitrogen cycle. <laughs> so, okay. We tell people all the time in our reef club, first question, they go, I've got allergy. What do I do? How long have you had the tank set up? And then the next thing is, well, don't worry about it. It will take care of itself, but you need to be patient. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because it is part of the normal cycle process. And Grizz, Depending on the species. Sorry, Cheryl. And uh, Grizz Aquatics made another great point uh, about silicates. And I'm not, I, I don't know enough to speak to that. Um, Cheryl, do you? Not really. I do have a silicate test kit. <laughs> So you know if you got them, but not, right. Uh, but I have really not had a problem with that. Well, Chris, get with me on the side. Uh, maybe in the future you can jump in when, when you're saying something excellent that we just uh, can't speak to. But I do know you're right. Um, silicates can cause major problems. Um, I don't even have the test kit, though, so you're going to have to help us out there. But you're right. And... No nuisance algae for about three years by taking extra steps during the setup, right? And you only tore the tank down to moving. See, I think it's possible to do that once you're an experienced reef keeper and you know what's up and you know what's coming. I just think that anyone, I, I just like to say things so that anyone new doesn't freak out if they do go through it um, because, you know, I think that's cool though. I'd love to know what you mean by extra steps during setup. Like, for instance, in my tanks with algae scrubbers, I don't necessarily add the algae scrubber until there's something for the scrubber to, I always say eat and people jump me. It doesn't eat, but you know what I mean. Take up. Um, so, yeah, share your secrets. I'd love to hear them. And, and Grizz is saying it can be avoided if the proper steps are taken. Well, share. <laughs> Let's hear it. And, Dylan, you have a bacterial bloom, cloudy water. Eh. You're good. You're good. Try and you try jumping in lost audio. Grizz, I'll get you on, with you on the side. Um, message me if you would, um, and we'll make sure you can get in in the future. All right. So guys, uh, I did want to keep it a little more brief. Holly, again, I will bring this up. I'm making mental note and physical note to bring this up again at the beginning of next week, no matter the topic. Um, so actually, we might have a guest speaker next week. Um, I have a phone call tomorrow and two phone calls tomorrow, and I'll be making some pretty cool announcements this week. So watch, watch for the posts. <laughs> and it, it, But even if we have a speaker, I'll make sure that I at least touch on that question before we start um, because I want to get you the proper peroxide if you can use that, if you can even reach it. And I will talk to you on the side in the message. So, um, But anything else, guys, that we didn't get to, that we need to cover? If we rush through hydrates and you have a question, don't forget you can ask in the comments. And with that, I'm going to tell the ladies to say goodnight. Good night. Look, good night. Look at us under two hours.